Welcome to the Renegade Nutrition Podcast, where we discuss all things wellness. I'm Eleni Welch, nutritionist. And I'm Kay Boyer, health enthusiast. Welcome back, Renegades. Welcome, Renegades. Welcome back. Um, I needed a little reset of my health, so I'm, gl- I'm glad we're here, Eleni. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, yeah. You've been traveling a lot. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like this is good encouragement. It gets me back on the wagon. It gets our listeners back on the wagon. So this is good. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm excited for this week, you telling me about blood sugar. Blood sugar. Yes. Again. Yes. <laughs> This more one, about it. This one is a, is more of like a specific topic. So this one okay. is 10 foods to improve insulin resistance. I like this angle on it because it's more like 10 foods to help instead right. of all the other facets of it. It's like, here, eat these. Ten, ten yeah. Foods. Instead of things yeah. you can't eat. Yeah. It's things to add into your diet yes. to help. And specifically with insulin resistance, but anybody who's having difficulties controlling their blood sugar, because Ooh, everyone in America, go ahead. Everyone in America, <laughs> okay. because yeah. repeated blood sugar issues lead to insulin resistance. Yes. And many, many health problems. Like I feel like the insulin resistance is like, boom, it's a part of it. Right. It like, is the origin of many, many health yeah, problems. Yeah. yeah so you're this, totally right. Yeah. So this will be good for all of us. Yeah. And I'm hoping these 10 foods are like, Chocolate. <laughs> they're not chocolate, but they're, they're not, not chocolate. But they're not like gross. Okay. <laughs> good. Good. Okay. I'm excited then. They're good food. Okay. They're good food. Some of them, I should say it's kind of like foods, herbs, tinctures. Oh, yes. But I didn't want to say 10 edibles because I feel like people associate the word edible <laughs> yes, yes, now with like yes, marijuana. Yes, yes, yes. So I want to be like 10 it's edible things. 420 here at the podcast. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So I was like, how, how do I phrase this? Cause it's yeah. some of them are like extracts. So it's not like mm. a food you would go buy in a supermarket, oh. but it's, it's a functional food. Okay. It's a functional food. Okay. I like that too. It, yeah. Okay. Well, Maybe we'll call them 10 functional foods. Okay. Just to stand out. Yes. I like that. It makes us sound more natural. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So first off, hello to our listeners in South Africa. South Africa. Yeah, you visited South Africa. I love South Africa. It is near and dear to my heart. Ugh. I have good friends in South Africa who I miss like every single day. So yeah. Yes. I had a professor from South Africa whom I loved and dude perfect on YouTube went to South Africa and it looked amazing. That's what I know of South Africa, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, yes. And our friends were in the Pretoria area, which most people, if you're a tourist visiting South Africa, I think Cape Town tends to be where the tourists go. Sounds familiar. There's a lot of unsafe areas in South Africa. So I do recommend, like we were visiting friends, they knew their way around. We felt safe with them. Mm -hmm. But I think it was really eye-opening for me having grown up in the U.S. and just the like the things that people are used to in South Africa that are like total culture shock coming from the U S like like, our friends that lived in the Pretoria area, which again is not really the safest area. Every house has security, like layers and layers of security. So like they had walls with barbed wire on top of them, like spikes. They had a gated entrance. They had their own, privately hired security company because the police are corrupt so if somebody's breaking into your house you can't call the police like oh so they have private security companies they had like laser perimeters set up around their house holy cow so when you would drive into their house which we were always with them they like enter a passcode and then they check in with their security company so um, they had a whole system with their private security company where it asks for the password mm-hmm. and you can, um, like give a certain password that lets the security company know, like somebody has a gun to your head. You know what I mean? Like, because they want you to pretend everything's normal. Right. Because, because if you gave the alert when somebody's holding a gun to your head, like if they're like, right. let me into your property, and they're like, say the password or I'll shoot you. Like, yeah. how would you let your company know? I'm saying the password, but things aren't okay. So when you said the password a certain way, the it's security company was knew something was wrong and they would come. Okay, this place sounds very dangerous. <laughs> like, why are you there? 
it was a little so you like were in the area we were at like whoa you don't stop at traffic lights because if you stop at a traffic light you're probably going to get carjacked like there are literally people hiding in bushes on either side of the Wait, road for our south african listeners i hope you're in a safe place <laughs> so yeah, are you okay say place. the password <laughs> yeah say renegade if you need and then oh. all of their so you don't stop at the traffic lights oh my or stop signs because you could get carjacked because people wait for people to wait mm. and then they break into your car okay um and also like all of their windows had bars on them okay. and their house had like a gated portion inside where at night when we would go to sleep they would lock an iron gate and oh. lock us in okay so the bedrooms were all like the back part of the house you would lock an iron gate so if somebody broke into the house which they've still with all that security had people break into their house okay uh-huh. i don't let's i don't know and then you okay. lock yourself in at night so at least they can't get to your bedrooms oh Oh my word. Yep. Okay. So that was like, at least in that area of South Africa where our friends lived, that's literally just their everyday life. That's and that was day. like normal. And that's not stressful to them. Oh, I'm sure it's stressful. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that was one of the things they wanted. Like, I remember before they came, they're like, we want you coming from the US. We want you to understand how privileged you are. Holy cow. Because they came and visited us here in Iowa. And it's like, people leave their their front doors unlocked right, when right. they go to sleep at night. Right. They leave their cars running at the yes. grocery store. Yes. Like literally JWs, people leave their cars running yes. while they go grocery shopping with they, their keys in yeah. it. Like, well, this is the joke of downtown Kelowna. There was a sweatshirt on the bench that was there for a couple of days. We're like, oh no, someone left their bench or left their um, sweatshirt on the bench. And then a couple of days later, it was laundered and folded right back on its <laughs> spot. Or whoever was gonna come. That's what happens in Kelowna. If you leave your door open, people will come in and clean your house for you. <laughs> they took the sweatshirt and washed it for them. They like, this it. poor person. I'll wash it and fold it yeah, back for you. Back for it. Okay. See, I love where we live. I, I love Kelowna. Right. <laughs> but it really did give me an appreciation. I That's mean, there are a lot of unsafe areas in the U.S. too. I'm fully yes. aware of yes. that. Right, right, right. There are lots of really dangerous places to live and unsafe neighborhoods. Yes, there is. We don't live in one of them and we're fortunate. But yes. them having like come here, like I think it was shock for them. They're like, all of your properties are just open. Like you don't have gates like around your house. Cortisol. They just like let it glue. Yeah. And like, ooh, breathe. And yeah. D- relax. Yeah. It's crazy. That's crazy. So even with all the security they had, they've had people get past their fences and their laser perimeters and all these things. And there are areas of South Africa where the crime rates are lower mm-hmm. and they don't have all those things in place yet, but it seemed like it was kind of spreading. Okay. So hopefully tur- if you like are a tourist, you can find those. Yeah, places. I think like, again, Cape Town is a safe area. Mm-hmm. There are safe areas. But all of that to say, if you're in South Africa, we appreciate. We appreciate, appreciate you. you. And like what your daily life looks like. Yes. And also we are thankful like and yeah. and don't take for granted what we have in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, yeah, that's a wise Here's a fun fact about South Africa. Um, The first heart transplant in the world took place in South Africa in 1967. Whoa. Yes, performed by Dr. Christian Bernard at Gurut Shur Hospital in Cape Town. That is amazing. Yes. That many years ago. Oh, my word. 1967 and in South Africa. I think that's pretty amazing. Can you imagine during that surgery, like they like switch the heart over and then it takes and that person's alive and they're like, (laughs) <laughs> yeah because there was probably a lot of failures before that uh-huh. and also being the like patient who had like they must have been in dire straits volunteered to go under that procedure of like yeah. nobody's ever done this yeah first in the world oh, oh, oh. gosh amazing. a lot of energy in south africa oh my yeah. yes god way to go south africa yep yeah we appreciate you thanks yeah. for being listeners thanks for listening anyway yeah. all right Well, now we'll get into our episode. So 10 functional foods that can improve insulin resistance. I'm here for it. The first one is turmeric. (gasps) Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Our anti-inflammatory friend. That's right. So turmeric is a herbaceous perennial. Normally Mm. the part of the plant that you're using is the root. Mm. Um, 
It is a member of the ginger family, and it's been used for treatment of diabetes in Ayurvedic and traditional Chinese medicine for like centuries. Cool. Mm -hmm. And don't let it stain your counter. Yeah, and it does stain. <laughs> I've used fresh gin, fresh ginger and turmeric in like the blender before, and I'm like, oh, our blender is now yellow. Yes, yes, it really forever. is. Forever. <laughs> yep. That's just what color it is forever Magic now. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so the active component of turmeric, which is curcumin, has caught attention as a potential treatment for diabetes um, because it is safe and inexpensive and mm. reduces glycemia and hyperlipidemia in animal studies. I love it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's delicious. And it is delicious. Yeah. Um, a systematic review of 16 research articles of randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical Boom. trials Boom. included a total of... 1,309 participants. So 16 a study. That is a lot going on. So there. it's a systematic review. So when they do a systematic review, they search all the literature that already exists. Oh, okay. So they collected 16 studies. The total over all of these studies was 1,309 participants. So mm -hmm. that's the collective total over 16 studies. Um, 1,207 of those were type two diabetes okay. patients. Um, 595 of them were women, 495 were men. Okay. So it was pretty evenly split. The age range was from 18 to 85 years mm -hmm. and the studies were performed in a series of different countries. So 13 from Iran, one from Mexico, one from South Africa, one from Japan. I did find a lot of studies from Iran when I was looking up. Wow. Turmeric the... and, oh yeah. And we're diabetes. Probably it's more like it's grown there a lot. Yeah. More. And it's a lot more in their diet. Cultural. Yeah. Like it's yeah. definitely a cultural part of them. Um, so five studies used curcumin, which okay. is the active component. Five used nano curcumin, which is just a nanoparticle version of that. Um, and then they used various forms of it. So powder, fresh pills, capsules. Mm. So looking at turmeric in all of its forms mm -hmm. basically and a few of them used the turmeric associated with piperine which is the active component in black pepper mm. so one of the things that i understand about curcumin is that our body doesn't absorb it very easily it tends okay. to stay pretty localized in the gut which is beautiful because it has anti-inflammatory properties so it's great for gut healing oh yeah but if you want your body to be able to absorb it you need to take it with piperine. And I think my understanding of that is that it, the piperine actually kind of shuts down one system of, I want to say like detoxification in your body, Okay, which otherwise would have eliminated the curcumin before it could have a chance to float around your bloodstream. Wow. Interestingly enough. Yeah. So the, I see that in supplements like curcumin with piperine Okay. As like a, a method of getting it to absorb better wow. and not just have localized effects within the gut. Wow. Um, and the doses administered also had a wide variation from 80 milligrams per okay. day to 2,100 milligrams per really? day. And the period of intervention ranged from eight weeks to 16 weeks. So across the okay. 16 studies, these are all the differences between the studies. But despite the variations between those studies, the studies collectively showed that the use of curcumin resulted in significant reduction of lipid peroxidation, wow. fasting blood glucose levels, glycated hemoglobin, which is the hemoglobin A1C, triglycerides, total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, which is the quote unquote bad cholesterol. We know all cholesterol is good in the right amounts. <laughs> C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker, systolic and diastolic blood pressure. It also caused an, a significant increase in HDL cholesterol levels, so the good cholesterol, um, and serum antioxidant levels. Wow. Mm -hmm. The studies also showed that the use of curcumin could improve depression and anxiety levels. Anything to help. <laughs> and the primary reported side effects of taking curcumin were stomach pain and upper abdominal pain. Oh, okay. So if you pretty mild in comparison to what it's doing in your body. <laughs> yes. Yes. And if you maybe took it with food, would that help? Or do you need to take it? With, um, I, I think it probably varied over the studies. I'm okay. sure 
each one did something slightly different. Okay. But going from 80 milligrams to 2,100 milligrams would be quite a, a leap. Mm-hmm. So I would guess that a smaller dose. Okay. Maybe wouldn't cause that same effect. Yeah. I've used turmeric and taken turmeric capsules and never had it cause okay. GI distress, but, okay. um, but everybody's different too. Another study, a 2009 study found that curcumin, the active component of turmeric, was 500 to 100,000 times more effective than the prescription drug metformin at activating glucose uptake. That's a huge number. (laughs) Huge number. (laughs) In another study of 240 pre-diabetic adults, patients were given either 250 milligrams of curcumin or a placebo Mm -hmm. every day. After nine months, none of those taking the curcumin supplements developed diabetes, but 16.4% of the placebo group did. Really? Mm -hmm. I'm always a believer after these podcasts. Now I'm going to (laughs) go eat turmeric for lunch. Golly. (laughs) Um, Turmeric is a member, like I mentioned, of the ginger family, and they have similar effects on blood glucose, which brings us to our next food, which is ginger. Okay, wait, pause on turmeric first. Yeah. How would you suggest us eating it? Like Mm. add it to our diet, do the pill, do the, what? I don't know. What do you think? Or in the morning and night? I think it almost depends on the person. So somebody who's having blood sugar issues is pre-diabetic, has diabetes. I would have them take it in as many forms as possible. So I would have them take capsules probably. Okay. Um, but I also would use fresh turmeric just because I'm a believer in real food, like (laughs) real food yeah, 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 and a series of modalities. Um, I don't, I don't really know whether to recommend it with the piperine or not when you take it in a capsule, Mm, but the way I've done it, which is delicious is to make it kind of like a chai tea. So I would do Mm. fresh turmeric. Yes. Um, steep it with fresh ginger. Yum. Do it with like frothed coconut milk. And I do just actually, because piperine is the active component of black pepper, I just sprinkle a little black pepper in it and let it all steep together and then drink it at night as like a bedtime tea. That sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay. That would, thank you. And you could blend it up too and then strain it. So if you wanted, you could put in the blender with like the hot coconut milk, blend it, strain it, and then just drink the liquid yum but it is really good and i add honey like i add honey to that <laughs> yeah 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 that'd make it yeah. even extra good but you could yeah. use it fresh in your food it has great flavor we also i also have turmeric like in a bottle okay and like, like powdered nice. okay. turmeric okay um and so you could just use turmeric in your cooking it's really good in a lot of like ethnic foods, you can, it's a strong flavor. It kind of yeah. has a very earthy flavor. Yeah. So you would have to experiment with it. Get a good recipe. But I would, yeah. for anybody who's, and it's really good for inflammation too. So um, our neighbor, after he had knee surgery, I made him these like healing energy bites. So I blended up dates with the ginger turmeric. Um, What did I do? Some vitamin C. A couple different things. That's Coconut. amazing. And what made a good the turmeric. Oh, yeah. For someone after being in the hospital. Amazing. Yeah. And the turmeric, I put a lot of turmeric in it and it was really good. Like they, mm. I ate a few myself. So you can do functional foods like that where you can Yum. make it tasty, like the dates, obviously, and coconut and all that stuff made it like these little energy bites. Yum. But then you add in the turmeric, you add in the ginger, you add in the vitamin C, things to help with inflammation. So if you're having issues with inflammation, that's good. Um, There's lots of good supplements too out there that use turmeric as part of an anti-inflammatory complex. Okay. Okay. So there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, But I would say if you have diabetes, if you have blood sugar control issues, capsules, fresh form, powdered like spice form, Mm -hmm. just doing some of that every day is a good way to do it. That's amazing. And it complements ginger, mm. which is our next one. So you can do the two together. Ooh. So yeah, they taste really good together. They taste Agreed. good together. I yep. recommend it, especially in that like nighttime tea. That was delicious. Um, in a randomized double blind placebo controlled trial, 88 diabetics were divided into two groups. Every day, one group received a placebo okay. while the other group received three one gram capsules of ginger powder. Okay. After eight weeks, the ginger group reduced their fasting blood sugar by 10.5%. Oh, 
Okay. But the placebo group increased their fasting blood sugar by 21%. Oh, so that is significant. Significant. Oh. In addition, the insulin sensitivity increased significantly more in the ginger group. So their bodies became significantly more sensitive to gin- to uh, insulin. So reducing the insulin resistance, which is basically an insensitivity to insulin. Mm. Um, in another study, re- researchers found that 1,600 milligrams per day of ginger improves eight markers of diabetes, including insulin sensitivity. Whoa. Mm -hmm. You know what? I like these options because it's like, it doesn't hurt for me to just take a little Mm -hmm. ginger turmeric. Like there's Mm -hmm. zero side effects other than your tummy if you have too much, but, but I mean, that's even more unlikely, but awesome. And it tastes good. It tastes good. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually, I learned this hack from a family friend, Pua, who is a native Hawaiian, so of course she knows about ginger yes i'm jealous yeah (laughs) um and she taught me like you literally so when you buy fresh ginger in the store because i would like not go through it fast enough because normally when you're making foods that use ginger Mm -hmm. they use like maybe an inch of ginger at a time right so potent right so she actually just puts the whole thing in the freezer brilliant so i don't wrap it in anything i just buy a chunk of fresh ginger put it in the freezer and then every time you need like an inch of it for recipe, you just pull it out of the freezer, cut that little chunk off. This is brilliant because my ginger little root ball always goes bad. This is bad. Yeah. So you just put it in the freezer. And also the best way to peel ginger, I've learned from Pua, is to use the back of a spoon. So like not trying to use like an actual peeler, you just use a spoon and you scrape at it and the skin all just comes off, but you it don't works. scrape away the ginger. It works really well. Whoa. Mm-hmm. Get it wet or something? Nope. Whoa. Just okay. use a spoon. I'm going to try this. Because the skin of ginger is very thin. So if you're using yeah. like a vegetable peeler, which you, you would take use, off. Yeah. you take off a lot of ginger because it's made for things like cucumbers that have thick skin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wow. This is such good knowledge. So just use a spoon. Yeah. 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 And just scrape at away at it. I mean, yeah. But honestly, when I use it frozen, I don't peel it. I just put the whole thing in. Yeah, I agree. Because the skin is thin. Don't they say that the um the skin is a lot of nutrients? Yeah, and a lot of so, foods, the skin is actually the most nutrient dense yeah. part of the food. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Like so I just skin. do that. So yeah. I like that. I um had bought a bought a bunch in early pregnancy, thinking I'd be sick, but then I wasn't sick, so I just had a bunch to use. But one of my favorite ways to do it was to just grate it. So I have a microplane. So I just grate the frozen ginger. I wouldn't peel it. Just okay. grab it, grate however much I wanted into a cup of hot water. Okay. Add a little honey and just drink it like a tea. Like a tea. Mm-hmm. Amazing. I do have ginger tea bags. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. But to just have it fresh. Oh, it's much okay. better fresh. Add it to my grocery list here. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um okay the next functional food is cinnamon cinnamon doesn't love cinnamon make the perfect tea yes add the cinnamon in the turmeric ginger tea it sounds amazing and cinnamon is one of the oldest spices and the most popular spices in the world it's been used for millennia because it's amazing because it's amazing both for flavoring and medicinal purposes Hmm. um cinnamon has been shown to normalize blood sugar levels in type 2 diabetics by improving their ability to respond to insulin whoa so again insulin resistance Hey there, Renegades, Eleni here, briefly interrupting this episode of the Renegade Nutrition Podcast. I wanted to highlight a company that Kay and I have recently discovered that we love, and that company is Bulletproof. Bulletproof sells high quality nutritional supplements, and every product that Kay and I have tried from them personally, we have found to be excellent. It's important when you choose a supplement that it contain the bioactive forms in order for it to be effective and Bulletproof has just the right forms and just the right amounts. Right now, if you go to Bulletproof.com and use the code RENEGADE15 at checkout, you can receive 15% off your order. That's RENEGADE, R-E-N-E-G-A-D-E-15. Use that code at checkout to get 15% off and we'll earn a small commission too. Thanks for your support. All right, back to this week's episode of the Renegade Nutrition Podcast. So cinnamon works in part by slowing the rate at which the stomach empties after eating. Okay. So in one study, subjects ate about a cup of rice pudding with and without a teaspoon of cinnamon. Okay. Adding the cinnamon slowed the rate of stomach emptying from 37% to 34.5% and significantly slowed the rise in blood sugar levels. So I know that doesn't like sound like a 
big difference, yeah. but it was a significant clinical difference. Yeah. Yeah. And even less than half a teaspoon a day of cinnamon reduces blood sugar levels in type two diabetics. How funny that like a small decision I would make in the school cafeteria line. Right. Uh, do you want your, you know, do you want your rice pudding? Yes. Do you want cinnamon? Yes or no. I mean, like make right. a difference in your health. That's so interesting. Yeah. And if you're just at home and you're making a breakfast, let's say you're having kind of a high carb breakfast, like it's the weekend and you're having a special treat and you're having, let's say waffles. Yeah. You just sprinkle cinnamon on them. I yes. mean, it would be delicious anyway. Yes. So a teaspoon, half a teaspoon of cinnamon. So a cinnamon toast crunch is not such a bad idea, right? It's now. a terrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> no amount of cinnamon can slow down what happens in cinnamon toast crunch. One good ingredient in that. <laughs> it's cinnamon. probably not high quality cinnamon either, if yeah. we're being honest. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Uh, that just reminds me my friend Emily always sends me whatever like sh- when she goes grocery shopping she specifically looks for like the grossest cereals yes. you know what I mean she Thanks always sends food. me pictures because it's like bright colored like <laughs> yeah she sends me pictures because there's always like these collaborations like Betty Crocker and like General Mills team up and make like funfetti cupcake cereal yes, like she yes, just yes, yes sends yes. me all these things like God, sugar on sugar on sugar process, just yes. to be like just so you know this exists in the grocery store just so you know this exists <laughs> just so you know my boy is like i want that and yeah. i want that like who doesn't want cupcake cereal yes. why are you combining those things and feeding it to kids for breakfast yes. like it's mind-blowing yes. anyway yes. anyway we digress we digress so yes just yeah, add okay. real cinnamon, high quality, yes. good organic to cinnamon to your real food. Yes. <laughs> That's the best way to do it. Okay, so the next food is not as fun as cinnamon, turmeric, and ginger. Okay. <laughs> but it is olive leaf extract. Olive leaf extract. Extract. So this is where I'm like, they're functional foods. They're all edible, but it's not necessarily like you're going to go to the grocery store and pick up. Yeah, where would I find this? Um, probably online or at supplement companies. Okay. Okay. So the university of Auckland researchers demonstrated that olive leaf extract could decrease, um, or increase insulin sensitivity, decrease insulin resistance Mm. in a randomized double blind placebo controlled crossover study. So crossover means that each group went through a placebo and an experimental mm, phase. I like that. So that's cool. That's kind of like the next level. I, I like that. Is every Because then you know you didn't just select accidentally, even though it's randomized, accidentally select people that were more yeah. be, like, yes. benefited. But yes. yes. So crossover, both people go through a placebo and through an experimental. Mm. Um, so 46 overweight men were divided into two groups. One group received the capsules containing the olive leaf extract and the other group received a placebo. After 12 weeks, the olive leaf extract had lowered insulin resistance by an average of 15%. Yeah. It also increased the productivity of insulin producing cells in the pancreas by 28%. So that's pretty cool. Um, The researchers noted that supplementing with olive leaf extract gave results comparable to common diabetic therapeutics, such as metformin. Wow. Which has way more side effects than things like olive leaf extract, turmeric, (laughs) ginger, real food, food, right? Metformin has a lot of side effects. Wow. Um, In an animal study, rats were fed olive leaf extracts. Um, at 50 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, the rats were fed a high fat diet. I like that. No, a high fat diet Mm -hmm. that included the olive leaf extract, reduced inflammation in their liver and adipose tissues, improved their glucose tolerance and decreased hyperinsulinemia, hyperinsulinemia. (laughs) Wow. Yep. Okay. Again, that's an animal study, but remember animal studies are the first step before human studies. So yeah, yeah, it has to be translated into human study, but anytime something shows a positive effect like that in an animal study, it's a good sign. Yeah. Okay. The next functional food is black seed, black seed. Um, so I, so I take it's, I call it black cumin seed. 
Okay. There's a lot of different names for it. It's sometimes called Roman coriander, black sesame, black cumin, and black caraway. Okay. It has a lot of different names, but okay. it is a, a plant that has been used for centuries to promote health and fight diabetes, especially in the Middle East and in Southeast Asia. Cool. So I have black cumin seed oil. Cool. Um, it's been called the remedy for everything but death. <laughs> I love it. Uh -huh. I love it. <laughs> Sounds like I need it. Uh -huh. do you, is the, does it taste okay? Or you put it? Well, in here's what's interesting. Okay. So I bought it because I heard about it in a podcast. Yes. I, I too listen to podcasts. <laughs> and then buy whatever they say. Yeah. And Same. it was just as like a whole cool, like I could spend an entire episode talking about the black cumin seed and everything that it does. Cool. And in that episode, she recommended the brand, which I'll link in the show notes. I have to look at it. I don't have it at the top of my memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like one of those things where you look at the bottle every day and you just don't remember nope. what it says. Right, right. Yeah. So funny. I'll link it what type it is. Um, but oh, it's Zatic. Z A T I K. Zatic. Zatic. Zatic Naturals. Okay. And I buy their black cumin seed oil. And in the episode, she made this big deal out of like how gross it is. Oh. I think it tastes totally fine to me personally. Oh. It has a little bit of like a licorice kind of oh. aftertaste okay this is one of those taste bud things uh-huh so i can understand like, why people don't yeah. like it but she yeah. was like it's bitter and gross and you're gonna have to mix it with i just literally take it straight up and i think it's good you can oh my word because i don't like licorice so i might be like it's not a strong licorice flavor yeah. but it's okay. also just not bitter like she made it sound okay and i just mix it with water and you're not taking a giant amount yeah um and I gave it to my husband because I was curious and he also thought it tasted good. So, yeah. but again, both of us do like black licorice. Yeah. It's that's just the closest flavor I could compare it to. Yeah. That's yeah. not necessarily the flavor. Yeah. Yeah. But caraway kind of has that. If you've had caraway, it kind of has that flavor. So it's black cumin seed. So they, pre and that company specifically with the oil they make, it's all like expeller pressed and cold um, you know yes, what i mean it's all yeah. the right processes yeah. to yeah. get it out in the best form yes yeah. um so that's zatic natural z-a-t-i-k so that's the brand i recommend but to me it tastes great and honestly if you were making a drink okay. <laughs> with the ginger turmeric cinnamon yes i would fully add in a teaspoon of that yeah black cumin seed oil because it has just the right flavor profile to make it taste like a chai tea oh that sounds amazing yeah okay so that's an easy way to do it i used to just take it like put it in a glass and just drink it before a meal but this all sounds very mm -hmm. good yeah this is could revolutionize america uh-huh uh-huh um i was taking it for the pcos because that often contributes to insulin resistance so i was just doing everything i could to control mm -hmm. my yeah. blood sugar at that point and i think it really did help so wow. Um, a prospective study was conducted at a health center in North India with 60 patients. The patients were divided into two groups of 30 each. In group one, patients were given a prescription medicine for diabetes called a tour of a statin, 10 milligrams once a day, and the tablet metformin, 50 milligrams twice a day for a period of six weeks. So that was group one. In group two, which was the black cumin seed group, the patients took those same medications, so the atorovastatin and the metformin twice a day, and they took the black cumin seed oil, 2.5 mils, twice daily for a period of six weeks. So they each took the same medications, but one group additionally received the black cumin seed oil, the other group didn't. They measured their fasting and postprandial blood glucose, fasting lipid profile, and waist circumference before and after the six weeks. The treatment group that took the black cumin seed oil showed significant improvement with reference to total cholesterol, low density lipoprotein cholesterol, which is the LDL, the quote unquote bad, and fasting blood glucose. The black cumin seed oil was found to be effective as an add-on therapy in patients of insulin resistance. Um, the black cumin seed oil had a significant activity in the diabetic and dyslipidemic patients. So it was a good adjuvant therapy, okay. basically. Okay. So that's what they recommended was they didn't just, I wish they had done it like with the medication and then with the medication and the black cumin seed and then one group without, without yeah. the medication, yep. Yep. but um, that's the limit of the study. In another study of 94 diabetic patients, patients were prescribed either one, two, or three gram dosages of the black cumin seed oil capsules, they found that at a dose of two grams per day,
black cumin seed significantly reduced fasting blood glucose and insulin resistance. Mm. The higher dose of three grams per day did not result in additional benefits. So just two grams per day was sufficient. Mm. Um, Another systematic review of black cumin seed oil examined a total of seven articles within these seven studies. Black cumin seed oil was shown to significantly improve laboratory parameters of hyperglycemia and diabetes control after treatment with a significant fall in fasting blood glucose, blood glucose levels two hours after a meal, glycated hemoglobin, and insulin resistance, and there was a rise in serum insulin. These findings suggest that black cumin seed oil can be used as an adjuvant for oral anti-diabetic drugs in diabetes control. Wow. Okay. Had me convinced. Why not? I mean, if you're already taking the medications, why not take something to make them more yeah. effective? Yeah. And I would say, you know, if you're taking everything on this list and kind of adding it all together, who knows what the effects of that might be? Yeah. Considering that some of these functional foods outperformed metformin. That's amazing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I know it's worth the experiment with consulting from your doctor. Of course. Yep. Always ask your doctor of and course. never discontinue any medication without talking to your doctor. Right, right, first, right, right, right. Because you want to do it safely. Yeah. Okay. Functional food number six is spirulina. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, spirulina. spirulina. So normally that's kind of like a little plant we find in the ocean, yeah, right? Like a little blue green algae. <laughs> blue green algae type plant. Mm hmm. So in an animal study using rats, the rats were fed a fructose diet, so a high sugar diet, Mm -hmm. for eight weeks, which induced a significant increase in serum glucose, of course, Mm -hmm. insulin, cholesterol, triglycerides, and cardiovascular risk factors and insulin resistance. No surprise when you feed rats sugar, you give them a bunch of those risk factors, right? right, that come with high sugar intake. But when they treated the fructose-fed rats with spirulina extract, it improved their metabolic profile. In addition, fructose-fed rats exhibited a significant increase in liver, kidney, and heart lipid peroxidation levels and declined antioxidant. Oh, I'm sorry. So what I'm saying is the rats that were eating fructose, no spirulina. Okay. I was like, that sounds bad. <laughs> Exhibited a significant increase in liver, kidney, and heart lipid peroxidation levels and declined antioxidant defenses. So when you fed rat sugar, their basically like oxidized levels went up. So it affected their liver, kidney, and heart. And then they had lowered antioxidant defenses, which could eventually lead to things like cancer. Mm. So again, here's a good reason not to eat sugar, right? But when then they fed those fructose fed rats with the spirulina extract, they reversed all of those alterations. Amazing. Mm-hmm. With But they were still eating the fructose and the yes. spirulina. Yes. So I can have my cinnamon toast crunch <laughs> with spirulina. <laughs> I guess theoretically lady. speaking. <laughs> I guess theoretically, but don't do it, friends. But imagine what it would do for your body if you weren't preloading oh, it with sugar. I think how good you would feel. Uh-huh. Um, in a human study, the they enrolled 50 obese patients with obesity-related hypertension in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Each patient was randomized to receive two grams of spirulina or a placebo daily for three months. At baseline and after treatment, they measured the anthropometric parameters. So that's height, weight, um, head circumference, body mass index, like BMI. Um, And then they checked for adiposity at the waist, hip, and limbs, and skin fold thickness. So they basically were just measuring all of your possible measurements as a human. They also measured... I'm glad you know all these words. Thank you. They also measured plasma, lipid levels, inflammation, and oxidative stress biomarkers, along with insulin sensitivity. After three months of spirulina supplementation, there was a significant decrease in body mass, body mass index, so BMI, and waist circumference. Wow, with no change of diet, just adding just spirulina. Wow. Spirulina also had significant lowering effects on LDL cholesterol and interleukin-6, um, which is uh, like it's a type of immune cell that acts as both a pro-inflammatory and an anti-inflammatory molecule. So remember, inflammation is not always bad. You want inflammation when something's wrong in your body. Mm-hmm. 
And you want the ability to have anti-inflammatory effects in your body when you don't need the inflammatory effects Mm -hmm. anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So it can be good to increase inflammatory markers if your immune system is low and is not fighting disease well. Mm -hmm. So in the spirulina group, they increased that interleukin-6 and then they decreased um, LDL, or sorry, they decreased interleukin-6. My pregnancy brain is taking over. (laughs) Um, spirulina supplementation considerably improved total antioxidant status and insulin sensitivity ratio. And in another randomized study of insulin resistant patients, researchers compared the power of spirulina and soy to control insulin levels. They assigned 17 patients to receive 19 grams of spirulina a day. The other 16 patients received 19 grams of soy. So they wanted to compare spirulina versus soy. Okay. After eight weeks, the spirulina group on average increased their insulin sensitivity by (laughs) 224.7%. Wow. Awesome. The soy group increased their insulin sensitivity by 60%. So Hmm. that's actually not bad either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But spirulina worked way better. Compared to 200 Mm -hmm. something. Wow. In addition, 100% of the spirulina group improved their insulin sensitivity, while only 69% of their soy group improved. So still, like both of them helped improve insulin sensitivity, but spirulina, which is a lot less um, highly contested (laughs) in the nutritional world Uh Uh compared to soy, had a a better effect. If you are going to consume soy to help your insulin resistance, um, make sure it's whole unprocessed foods such as natto, like a fermented soy product or edamame versus processed tofu, which is like the white bread of the vegetarian diet. That's funny because it's so processed Mm -hmm. and void of nutrients. Yeah, void of nutrients. So natto to me, I've never tried it, but it's a fermented soy product. So Mm. You could try getting soy that way, but I'd recommend doing spirulina because Mm -hmm. it was more effective. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) definitely. Yeah. And you can add it. It's pretty tasteless. I've taken spirulina like powders and capsules. I think it's in a lot of like green superfood. Yes. yes, If you take any like green powders, oftentimes it has spirulina in it and you, I don't ever notice it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just a good way to get extra greens in, in every day. Okay. The next functional food is berberine. What is this? Berberine Berberine. is the bitter compound found in the roots of several plants, including plants like golden seal, barberry, and organ grape. Okay. This is another health food store. If I, or or I'll Google it. An extract, like the olive leaf extract. Again, it's a functional food because it's a food Mm -hmm. versus a supplement or, I mean, it would be a supplement in this context, Mm. but yeah, yeah. But it's kind of toast the line. Yes, yes. Um, it has been shown to be just as good as prescription diabetes drugs. Chinese researchers compared berberine to metformin in a pilot study of 36 patients. They found that berberine lowered blood sugar levels just as well as metformin within three months. The patients also significantly decreased their fasting blood glucose and their aftermeal blood glucose. Um, In the same study, researchers then gave berberine to 48 diabetics for three months. After only one week, berberine lowered both fasting and post-meal blood glucose levels. Wow. Okay, spell this word for me. Oh, it's B-E-R-B-E-R-I-N-E. Berber, okay. berberine. Berberine. Okay. In addition, their insulin resistance dropped by 45%. Um, Other researchers conducted a a meta-analysis of 14 studies. So over 14 studies, they looked at all 14. It had a total collective of 1,068 participants. They found that berberine performed just as well as metformin, glipizide, and rosetaglucosone. I've never heard of that one. (laughs) Metformin is the most common diabetes drug Mm -hmm. I hear of. Yeah. But those are three of the top diabetic drugs on the market and berberine performed just as well as them. Whoa. Over 16 studies with no serious side effects. And if you're having your ginger, turmeric, cinnamon tea, and you're having all the spirulina, I mean, you're doing spirulina, your black human seed, (laughs) your, your olive leaf extract. Yeah. I'm feeling good. Okay. The next one you'll like the functional food number eight is berries. Oh, I love berries. Now we're into more pronounceable things. Okay, good. Again. <laughs> good. 
I'm berberine to berries. <laughs> um, studies show that the body needs less insulin for sugar after a meal if berries are also eaten as part of that meal. Yum. Mm-hmm. In a study of healthy women in Finland, subjects were asked to eat white and rye bread with or without a selection of different pureed berries. Mm. Starch in the bread obviously is producing those after-meal blood glucose spikes, but the researchers found that adding berries to the bread significantly reduced the after-meal insulin spike. Which is where jelly must have came from Yeah, back in the day. If you made it right without adding tons of sugar. Right, right, right. <laughs> Just smush the berries. Don't add yep. all the other junk. So the berries they found were effective were strawberries, bilberries, lingonberries, and chokeberries. And so was a mixture consisting of strawberries, bilberries, cranberries, and blackberries. What? Raspberries and blueberries didn't cut it. I think they just didn't measure them. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Because those I eat those on the regular. So, right. Okay. I don't know. Because so, this was in Finland, so I don't know what the popularity oh. Oh, that's fair. Right. And they're yeah. they maybe like lingonberries and bilberries are just more of a popular fruit. And they're like the agriculture zone. Okay. Yeah. Our Finland listeners will have to let us know. Yes. Yes. Because yes. I have seen lingonberries as like edible ornamentals you can grow here. Um, but sounds but delicious. it's not something you normally would find in our markets. Mm, I live and die by berries, so I, I would love them. But yes, all all berries like blueberries and blackberries and they all yeah. are low glycemic. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to eat fruit, they're a good choice. And it turns out they might actually lower your glucose response. That's so amazing. But specifically the ones in the study were strawberries, bilberries, lingonberries, chokeberries, cranberries, and blackberries. Mm. Okay. Functional food number nine oh. that improves insulin resistance is dairy. Yes. Yes. So we talked about the benefits of dairy in our podcast episode, which was, is dairy good or bad for you? Mm -hmm. Um, There is a growing body of scientific evidence that links dairy intake to reduced type 2 diabetes. Oh, we did talk about that in that episode, too. Yes. Understanding, of course, that if you are one of the individuals, many individuals who is sensitive to dairy, it's not going to be one of the functional foods you include. But for those of you who can tolerate it. Um, The potential underlying mechanisms for this association between dairy and reduced risk of type 2 diabetes um, is that there are several components such as calcium, vitamin D, dairy fat, and specifically of the dairy fats, transpalmitoleic acid. Mm. Um, That specific acid, which is found in milk, cheese, yogurt, and butter, may substantially reduce the risk of insulin resistance and health issues related to insulin resistance, such as prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. Hmm. That comes from the scientists at the Harvard School of Public Health. Hmm. I've heard of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> a time or two. <laughs> and make sure if you're if you're choosing to include dairy in your diet that you're choosing raw dairy whenever it's available. Yes. And pasture raised whenever pasture. it's available. Raised. High quality dairy is what and we're talking not so about. Pasteurized, but right. pasture raised. Pasture raised <laughs> from cows, raised on pasture. Raw meaning it's unpasteurized. unpasteurized. That is very confusing. But the process of pasteurization is basically heating dairy to the point where it kills. kills. The, yeah. It kills bad bacteria, but it also kills all of the good bacteria. So when you can get unpasteurized, but like products, then that means the beneficial bacteria in it haven't been killed. And if you're getting it from a good source, you don't need to worry about the bad bacteria because that will be controlled because the good bacteria will outcompete the bad bacteria. Honestly, where you get into trouble is when you're taking dairy products from animals raised in unhealthy environments, yeah. like CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations, where they're in tight densities. They don't have access to outdoor fresh air, fresh grass. Poop everywhere. There's poop everywhere. In the air. (laughs) In the air, on the animals. That's when you get overgrowth of things like E. coli and listeria and salmonella and all those bad things. What people don't realize is when animals are out on pasture and they're healthy, they have their normal immune responses, then you're not at risk of nearly so many as those like bacterial infections. So if you're getting a conventional source of dairy, non-organic conventional CAFO, absolutely it should be pasteurized because I would not trust that product. (laughs) But if it's raw and it's unpasteurized and it's from 
organic grass fed cows that are happy and out on rotated pasture and well taken care of, then there's not a concern. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Um, sheep or goat milk is also usually a better option for many people. And so are raw cheeses and kefir. Mm. So fermented products. Okay. The very last functional food is protein. Protein. <laughs> yes. Kay likes this one. A 2011 study published in the International Journal for Vitamin and Nutrition Research found that the consumption consumption of higher amounts of protein during dietary treatment of obesity resulted in greater weight loss with than groups treated with lower amounts of protein. Mm. Adequate protein intake is of specific importance for people with insulin resistance mm. and type 2 diabetes because proteins are neutral with regard to glucose and lipid metabolism and they preserve muscle and bone mass, which may be decreased in people who have poorly controlled blood sugar. Mm. Mm-hmm. Lean protein foods such as organic chicken, wild fresh, free range eggs, lentils, yogurt, and almonds can help regulate your blood sugar levels and improve insulin resistance. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It sounds delicious. Listen, I'm just going to eat berries and protein and have that yummy tea and I'm I'm set. (laughs) Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, um, I just bought, well, this is a little side note because you said, um, wild free range chicken. I just bought one from natural grocers and I finally, um, what, what's called when you do overnight for 18 hours, Bone broth. I bone broth mm. it. And it was delicious. Did you just use the whole carcass well, or did you cook we, the meat and remove so it? So I cooked the meat on a bed of sweet potatoes. Um, and I did that for about six hours on high. So we ate the meat for dinner. Okay. But whatever kind of meat was left over yeah. stuck to the carcass. I put that back in with the, and this Mary's brand, it has some innards you throw in. Yeah. There. I threw in Eleni the innards. <laughs> <laughs> and I drank it. Way to go. And, and it I'm, tastes great, doesn't it? It tastes great. And it had, we took out the sweet potatoes, but it had a little bit of that broth from that stewing. Mm. Oh, it's delicious. Mm-hmm. So, anyway. That's the gaps way. Yes, yes, yes. I definitely did it from our Natasha. Mm-hmm. Dr. Um, Natasha Campbell. Yep. So anyway, that's my, um, if, and I could, when I drank it, I could sense how healthy it was for me. Like I could feel it deep in my soul. Your body was like, yeah, I need this. more of this, but I did it. My first phone brought and I, and I didn't get anyone sick. So, there we and are. you know, what's really good. Well, first of all, good for you. Yeah, thank you. And what's really good in bone broth are things like ginger and turmeric and Ooh. black pepper. Ooh, this is good. Yeah. Because those things are good I in the savory, her. especially fresh. Oh, this mm-hmm. is good. Mm-hmm. See, ideas I didn't even think of, Elaine. Oh, I like it when I'm like sick. It's really nice just to have bone broth with fresh grated ginger. Yum. In it. Okay. Mm-hmm. And turmeric too would be delicious, just grated. I love like it. Gin- like actual turmeric root, just grated in it. Add a little black pepper and you've got your bone broth and your insulin resistance improving formula. Can't wait to be sick again. <laughs> so I can drink that. I'm kidding, body. Don't get sick. We're yeah, gonna... you can drink it when you're healthy too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're extra healthy. Uh, anyway. Well, good. This was an excellent list and I feel good about it. It's cool to feel like you have power in what you are eating to help it out. Mm-hmm. instead of Right. Like we said earlier, not the, just what you can't have. Right. This is one of that positive mindset things, what I can do. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing that this mindset helps when you're starting to add in the healthy, I'm guessing that you're naturally going to start waning out the less healthy. Yeah. You know, if you're replacing a bad food with a good food, you're going to feel even better. Yeah. But the first step for many people who don't want to change their diet is, is to add in the functional foods. And again, remember, I really like, um, Jesse, the glucose goddess. She has all kinds, like, she's all about that. Right. Is like, maintaining your normal daily diet and hacks you can do to improve your blood sugar. So she's always a good resource too. I love it. For people who don't, aren't, aren't ready. Aren't ready. I won't say don't want to, because yeah. sometimes people do want to make the changes, but they just aren't ready. Yeah. So, and it, and it takes time. Like I right. was a total sugar addict and it took me like two years to kind of kick that. Yeah. Yeah. In a gradual way. It should be gradual and it should be a journey. Yeah. And you shouldn't put yourself in a place where you feel deprived, yeah. you know? Yeah. So these are good functional foods, 10 functional foods you can add in 
to your daily diet to help improve your insulin sensitivity and decrease insulin resistance. Yeah. Well, thank you, Eleni. <laughs> and for our listeners, go home and make a cinnamon ginger turmeric latte with black cumin seed oil. Yeah, man. Go be renegades. Go be renegades. Thank you for listening to the Renegade Nutrition Podcast. Please keep in mind that this podcast is an educational service that provides general health information. The content on this podcast is not a substitute for direct, personal, professional medical care and diagnosis. You should always talk to your doctor before making a dietary or lifestyle change. Go be renegades! Go be renegades!